All right, good to see everybody here tonight. Let's get started with the midweek service. Uh, glad you're here Wednesday evening. Appreciate you making the time to be in church. Let's start by singing together. Take your songbook, go over to 323, 323. That's standing on the promises, 323. Once you have it, let's stand together to sing it. One more time, Lisa, and then Bob will lead us, all right? On that first, standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring, glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, other ground is sinking sand amen and uh that's good singing tonight good to see you in church for wednesday evening and uh we're going to pray and ask god's blessing on our service and we'll uh remember diane stiltner in prayer as we open the service she uh, uh miss Jeanette just took her up to riverside she's probably going to get checked into the hospital again still having a lot of pain and doesn't know why uh so let's pray that they'll find out what's really going on there and uh, the Lord will reveal to them, because he knows what's going on, amen, and reveal to them what the problem is, and she can get some help, all right? Let's pray together. Father, we bow before you in prayer to ask your blessing upon our gathering together here this evening, and Lord, we do lift up our dear sister Diane tonight, and Lord, I pray that uh, you will put your healing hand upon her. And Lord, we realize that uh, we're, we're thankful for doctors and physicians and uh, those in the medical field, and we do ask that you would give them wisdom tonight as they examine Diane and, and that somebody there, you would enlighten them to know exactly what the problem is. Uh, but Lord, we look to you first and we ask for your help and we ask for you, you to touch your body. Lord, you know what the problem is and you know what, uh, what can solve it. And Lord, we pray that uh, you will take care of that matter uh, for Diane and Lord, relieve the, uh, just the intense pain that she's been going through. Thank you, Lord, for the health and strength you've given us that we're able to be here tonight. Uh, thank you for each one who's made their way here to our service this evening. Now, Father, we bow before the service here at the beginning that you would meet with us. You would minister to our hearts as only you can. So, Lord, we yield ourselves to you. Help us to just put out of our mind other things that would uh, capture our thoughts and divert our attention during this service, Lord, and, and hinder us from hearing from you tonight. And help us to focus for this next hour or so and, and receive what you have for each one of us. Bless the service, bless the music, bless the study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. 249 in your hymnal, 249. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Let's sing that first together. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shed a dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross, the Savior, Made me whole. 
justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a sending is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace he did proper. He saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory Tonight's missionary letters from the Sodders, missionaries to Zambia, Africa. Dear praying friends, hello dear friends, we want to thank you for keeping us in your prayers during the last few months. Since our last letter, we have now passed through a crazy election process. The months leading up to the election were characterized by sporadic violence and the election process itself took several weeks. The sitting president, Edgar Lungu, has won re-election and will serve at least another five-year term. We are glad the election is over, for peace has returned to the most part throughout the country. We praise the Lord that we are able to serve him here and share the gospel freely without fear. Please continue to pray for the nation of Zambia to go forward, and most of all, for many souls to turn to Christ for salvation. Zambia's economy is struggling with low copper prices, poor electric power supply, and high inflation, but we know God is in control. The ministry here continues to go forward. We have recently seen several more souls saved and baptized. The attendance has steadily increased, thanks be to God. Recently, God worked it out for a pastor and his wife from the U.S., whom we had never met, to come for a week and be a great encouragement to our people through teaching a block class on the book of Acts for the men and a topical study on the subject of heaven for the ladies. We averaged about 40 adults each evening, and we know it was a great help to the people. The renovation of the upper level of the building is proceeding. We have now put down the wood floor where the school will be in the future. I recently was looking for some commercial grade vinyl tiles which are unavailable here in Zambia. These tiles are needed to put down on top of the wooden floor. We needed about 2,400 square feet. I found a man in South Carolina who owned a construction business who had some for sale on Craigslist for about 30% cheaper than what you would find at Lowe's. My parents drove down to South Carolina one day to make the purchase for us, but when the man heard it was for the Lord, he laid it upon it. Sorry, let me repeat that. But when the man heard what it was for, the Lord laid upon his heart to give them to the ministry for free. Amen. This saved us over $1,000. We praise the Lord for this and know that God blesses people who will pass on those blessings to others. In the near future, we hope to add several windows, another staircase, and walls for the classrooms. Please continue to keep us in your prayers. In late October, we will have our second missions conference at the church and look forward to what the Lord will do. Our God is great and can do more than we ask or think. May he do that here and in your own life, lifting up Jesus the Sauters. Just a few years ago, they were here on deputation and part of our missions conference, and now they have a church and 
getting ready for his second missions conference. Isn't that great? It's just great to see. Good report from the Sauters. Uh, your prayer guide, everybody have one? Anybody need one? Just slip your hand up and they'll get you one right away. Everybody got covered? Good job. All right. If you start with the coming events on the back page, of course, we have Are You Inside tomorrow night down at the prison uh, at uh, the Central Reception Center. And then Friday night right here at 7 o'clock for the RU program at the church. And then Saturday morning at London from 8.30 to 10.30. And our soul winning and bus visitation at 10 a.m. on Saturday. And then uh, Sunday, of course, we'll have our 11th anniversary here at Bible Baptist Church. The 29th is the Hayride and the Bonfire. Make sure you make a note of that uh, from 5 to 8 p.m. All right. And then uh, we praise the Lord for Dino, who accepted Christ as his Savior on Sunday, and uh, we rejoice in that. Uh, there was no RU inside last Thursday down at CRC, and they had 14 Saturday at the London. No first-timers there, uh, all the regular guys. And uh, continue to pray for the different uh, church requests and the church ministries, if you would. And then, of course, these on our health list. And uh, um, we'd already printed these, but... Uh, Paula Ross got moved today to, uh, and I meant to look up the address and I didn't, but it's a uh, wet, Whetstone Nursing Facility. It's up by Riverside, uh, just a little past Riverside on Olajanji River on the right-hand side. We'll make sure we get an address for you for that so you can send cards to Paula, but she's up there for rehab for a little bit, and then eventually they hope to bring her down here to Monterey on Hoover Road. Um, so uh, continue to pray for Ronnie and Paula. Ross and keep them in your prayers and of course you can add Diane to that list there as well all right continue to pray for those in authority and uh, I know you relate to his uh, election comment there in Zambia and uh, they, they finished a crazy election and we're in the middle of one and uh, we'll uh, uh, see pray for the results of that coming up in just a few short weeks uh, continue to pray for these in our military uh, these who are battling cancer uh, these on the salvation list and praying for their salvation. And then uh, the unreached people groups that, again, God will raise up laborers to reach these people with the gospel and that they'll hear about Christ before it's eternally too late. And then our missionaries uh, highlighted by the Sauters uh, in Zambia. I do know um, Brother Yoder is preaching down in Lancaster this evening. And um, they had a great missions conference up in Canton, and uh, the church there took them on for support on a monthly basis, and so that's a good thing. And uh, the Moreland's had a good conference out in Chicago area. Uh, they haven't heard definitely yet whether the church has taken them on, but uh, he's pretty confident that they're going to support the missionaries they had in. So uh, that's a good report from uh, both of them. All right. Well, let's go to prayer uh, this evening. I'm going to have Brother Wallace come, if he would, and ask him to lead us in our prayer tonight as uh, he prays for us audibly. Pray along with him silently and uh, let's unite our hearts together in prayer for this list this evening. All right, let's pray. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for being such a great God. Lord, we depend on you so much. We are such a needy people. We show that uh, through our life, through the week, through the months that we lean on you. We learn to lean on you more. Lord, uh, we're so glad that we serve a God, the only true living God, that we can come to and make requests and leave those requests where we lay them, and we are confident that you will answer them. Maybe not in the time that we think, or the way we think, but Lord, as we sung while, sang the song a while ago, standing on the promises, Lord, we're going to be amazed one day when we stand before you and you might reveal to us all the promises that you've fulfilled in each and every one of our lives. And, uh, Father, it's, it's going to be amazing to finally be with you. But until then, and Father, as we bring these groups before you tonight, we know that your Bible says that your word is true. 
and that it's been put through the fire. There's nothing any pure than it. And that, uh, Father, as we bring these requests to you, we know that you hear. And Father, we pray, we pray for each and every one of our missionaries, especially the Sodders in Zambia, and the work that you have accomplished there through them, and the work that they uh, are continuing to do and walking by faith and trusting you to enlarge their coast. That, Lord, uh, you might be glorified. And Father, we pray for all, each and every one of our missionaries, the ones that need uh, answers of health and financial and spiritual. And uh, Father, we just uh, put each and every one of them before you. We thank you for uh, allowing this church and directing them to take on the Yoders. And Lord, we pray that, uh, Lord, that uh, it, it will be... Uh, uh, a blessing for them and to bless them, Lord, as they uh, stepped out by faith. And, and uh, Lord, the people who uh, take on the Moorlands. And, uh, Father, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a joy to have missionaries out of our church and that are out there uh, preparing to go to the mission field if you decide to tarry. Father, we do pray for those unreached people groups that the Moorlands and the Yoders and many others are trying to reach. And Lord, the word that's being tried to um, put in their language. And Lord, uh, if there's a way that we can do that quicker, only you know uh, what hour you're going to come. And Father, if it can be done quicker and and it. Uh, it is expedient. Lord, we know that you'll cause that to happen. But Father, just allow us to be used of you and uh, Lord, to uh, shine for you, this church. And Lord, that each and every one of us will uh, have a desire every day to wake up and uh, Lord, uh, desire that you would shine in our, our life and our church here at Bible, at Bible Baptist in Grove City. Father, we do pray for Diane Stiltner again. We lift her up to you that the doctors would um, somehow, some way, Lord, give them knowledge, give them wisdom uh, to perform whatever needs to be performed upon her body. But Lord, I would rather that you would just touch her with your hand and Lord, that you heal her and that there could be no answer conceivable of what in man's mind of why this happened or how it happened or how it came about. And Lord, that we could give you all the glory. Father, I pray for Paula Ross and her husband. Lord, I pray that you'll recover quickly. I pray that the rehabilitation will take its course and Lord, that uh, through it all, she'll learn to lean on you. She'll learn to, to trust you. Lord, we'll learn to trust you more as we pray for these people and we see the outcome. And Lord, that will just uh, help us to lean on you more and trust you more. Uh, Father, it's uh, so good to be in your house tonight and to be able to listen to your word taught. Lord, open up our understanding that uh, you would have each and every one of us to have. Lord, I know that you desire and you hunger for your children to grow in your word. But Lord, we need your help. We uh, need you to open up our understanding in areas that you would have our understanding come forth. That, uh, Lord, it would fit each and every one, each and every individual as you see fit. Father, I... Uh, do pray for the teen group. I pray for the ministries that go on here. I pray, pray for the bus ministry that Brother Andy has uh, taken over. And Lord, I pray that you'll help that to grow. I pray that the teen group will grow. I pray that each and every classroom will grow. 
Lord, help our teachers, Lord, me included, that, uh, Lord, we'll lean upon you and ask for your help and desire your help because I can teach it. I can tell the kids the story that you've laid on my heart. But, Lord, I so much depend on you to get it into their hearts. We see from the past that when you're in a church of 30 or 35 years and you look around and we have to ask ourselves the questions, where are the, the kids from 35 years ago that are now teenagers or now in their 20s and 30s and have children, have families? But Lord, I'm going to leave that up to you. I cry out to you to bring them back. And Lord, that they might... Uh, you might turn their hearts toward you. But Lord, we would see some of the children that went here 35 years ago to walk through that back door and desire for their, to walk with you. And Father, as our pastor comes and opens up your word, and give him wisdom, give him guidance. Lord, help him to say that which you would only desire him to say and to teach. Again, Lord, we want to thank you for being in your house tonight. I want to thank you for the privilege of being a child and being able to serve you. Lord, I can't thank you enough. So use us that you might shine through us and our church. We'll give you all the thanks and praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 507 in your hymnal, 507. Would you stand with me as we sing? Come thou fount of every blessing. 507 on that first together. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet. Sung by flaming tongues above, praise a mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing those last stanzas together.
Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. On that last all together, oh, to grace how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Grown to singing. You may be seated. Ushers will come and they'll get our offering now tonight and through the midweek. Give as God has blessed and prospered you. Remember your faith promise commitments for our missionaries and uh, be faithful to that and uh, I'm sure the Lord will honor you and bless you for that. All right, let's pray and we'll ask God's blessing on the offering. Brother Paul Abel, I'd like you to lead us if you Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the church that you've raised up here and the pastor you've called in here. And we ask that you would be with him tonight and bless him, bless the word. And we do pray that you'd uh, help each one of us to be hearers of the word and be able to use it in our daily lives. And then we pray that you'd bless the offering. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and uh, go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, please. Verse number 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Father, we bow before you this evening, and we ask you to help us as we study your word together tonight. I need your help as I teach this lesson, and I pray you'll give the people listening help tonight as they listen carefully to what the Spirit would say to them 
through your word tonight. Open all of our understanding of your word. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd be our guide and our teacher. Lead us into the truth that you have for us here as we look at the breastplate of righteousness. Help us as only you can. And I'll thank you for what you'll do, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. In our spiritual warfare, as we started last week, we learned that God gives us armor to put on, uh, spiritual armor. And we talked last week about how we start with the loins girt about with truth, okay? How truth is so important. David said, God, you desire truth in the inward parts. Uh, There's no substitute for being truthful. Uh, Satan, if he's anything, he is a liar. And that's the first thing he goes for. Uh, He lies. And so you have to hit him with the truth. Okay? Nothing stops a lie like the truth. Now tonight, we come to the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. That's important because the second thing we know about Satan is he always goes for the heart of man. He's always aiming at the heart. The heart which is our core. And the heart is, is, is difficult sometimes to pinpoint when it comes to Scripture because sometimes it seems like it's talking about our mind because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Sometimes we think it's our emotions because we even talk about when we love something, we use a little symbol and we put the heart symbol there that we love this or we love that. And so it's tied in with how we feel or our emotions or our feelings and our will and are we putting our heart into it or where we don't really want to do something so we say, well, their heart isn't in it. And, and so it's tied to all three of those things of our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. But it's in our heart that we feel guilty for sins, transgressions. We can feel guilty for sins, whether they're sins of what the Bible calls commission or whether they're sins of omission. Sins that we commit, that we do, are sins that, that, that because we're not doing what we should be doing. Those are sins of omission. Okay? And we get, we get smitten in our heart about those things. Who is it when we say the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength? Who is there among us that can say, they practice that all the time. We would all admit we fall short of that command. To, to doing that constantly. And, and, and if, we did, if we think we got that one down, try the second one. That we always love our neighbor as ourself. Uh, we probably fall short on that one too. And, and so we, we begin to think about, well, I don't do so well on those and then what about neglect of prayer? What about a lack of Bible study and really knowing God's Word? Uh, what about the times I neglect to witness to people like I should? I don't give them the Gospel. I don't leave a Gospel track. I don't say anything. Had opportunity to say something about Jesus and I didn't. Uh, we, we, we have all these things begin to build up and guess what? We, 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 we feel it in our heart. That heart begins to condemn us and Satan takes aim right at our heart. Now, I want you to look at a passage in the Old Testament. We'll come back here to Ephesians uh, chapter 6. But I want you to go to the Old Testament to one of the minor prophets named Zechariah. Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3. If you go to Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, and then go to your left, you'll find Zechariah. Okay, it's Zechariah, Malachi. So it's next to the last book of the Old Testament. And look at chapter 3, and we're going to look at a little known character in the Bible, but it illustrates what we're talking about with this breastplate of righteousness. And this little known character of the Bible is somebody named Joshua. Not the guy from the book of Joshua. Okay, He's the famous Joshua. This is the lesser known one. Here in Zechariah 3, notice verse 1. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. He's not just standing there. Somebody else is standing there. Satan's standing at his right hand to resist him. That word resist there means he's standing there to accuse him. Okay? 
And that's what he does. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Revelation chapter 12. And he does that. The Bible says he does that day and night. He just wants to stand there and accuse us to God. And then, by the way, it doesn't say he's the false accuser. Though he is a liar and he will say false accusations. But God just says he's an accuser. Most of us have enough true stuff he could say about us that would condemn us. And so he doesn't have to make stuff up. And so he's accusing him. But now look what he said. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, so, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And then the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and I will keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among those that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. And that's capital letters. That's talking about Jesus Christ. Okay? For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in that one day. And he's giving a prophecy here concerning Israel. But for our purposes, we're looking at Joshua here, standing before the angel of the Lord, and he's got on filthy garments. Okay? Not acceptable in the sight of God. And of course, Satan is there to, to accuse him and to remind him that he's never going to be accepted by God, that he's too filthy, that he's unclean, that he's not acceptable, and God will never welcome him and, and, and he, with those filthy garments. And we know, listen, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. We'll say more about that in just a little bit. But we understand that. But notice verse 4, God says, Take away the filthy garments, and I have caused iniquity to pass away from thee, and I'll clothe thee with a change of raiment. He puts, and by the way, that's exactly what happened when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. He took those old filthy clothes that you were in, your righteousnesses, which were his filthy rags, and he took them off you, he pardoned your iniquity, and he put on you the robe of righteousness. He put you on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you're dressed in his righteousness. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on Christ the solid rock I stand that's what he's referring to here so Joshua then is instructed to walk in the ways of God and obey the ways of the Lord and that he'll be a symbol of the coming Messiah the branch as he's mentioned here and he'll 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 show that message to Israel but the great illustration is the 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 righteousness that is given to us the righteousness that is of Christ, not of ourselves. Okay? That's the breastplate of righteousness. And for us to remember that Satan always attacks the heart of the believer. The heart is what he's going for. You understand the breastplate would, was such an important piece of the armor because it covered all those important organs. I mean, if you, if you took an arrow in this area and it damaged one of those organs in, in, the de in those days, you were a goner. There's just not much hope for you at all. And so it was important that always, before you go into battle, uh, that the breastplate was always in place and always ready to go. Now, let's give you several principles to remember about the breastplate of righteousness. Number one is this. Righteousness is all that Satan is not. I want you to go to 1 John. Go to the back of your Bible now. 1 John chapter 3. Righteousness is all that Satan is not. 1 John and chapter 3. 1 John 3 and verse 8. 1 John 3 and verse 8. 
The Bible says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Satan is wicked. Satan is unrighteous. Satan is evil. Satan is full of darkness. Uh, God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Satan is darkness and in Him there's no light at all. Okay? He, he's, he's a wicked, uh, wicked, evil being. Righteousness defeats Satan and turns him back every time. Now righteousness is one of God's attributes. He's a righteous God. Now, go back to the book of Psalms with me, will you? A couple verses in Psalms, and then we're going to look at one over in Jeremiah about the righteousness of God. Uh, look first, if you would, at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And notice with me verse 137. Psalm 119, verse 137. The Bible says, Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. So David reminds himself and reminds us that the Lord is righteous. He's upright in his judgments. And then look over, if you will, at Psalm 145, the 145th Psalm, and look with me at verse number 17, where the Bible says this, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is always righteous. The Lord is always right, you could say. Okay? Now, Jeremiah 23, verse number 6 says, In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called. The Lord our righteousness. So again, you, you see that righteousness is everything that God is and Satan is not. And so when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, we're reminding ourselves who God is and what God is and what Satan is not. Okay? Let me give you statement number two. Righteousness here is God's righteousness that is given to us. God's righteousness that is given to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Would you look there with me please? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Aren't you glad you have a Bible? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice with me the last verse of that chapter. Verse 21. Notice where the scripture says, For he hath made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the the what class? Righteousness of God in Him. We might be the righteousness of God in Him. So when I received Christ as my Savior, God put the righteousness of Jesus Christ on me. I got that. So did you. When you accepted Christ as your Savior. You say, what happened to my filthy garment? What happened to my sin? He put that on Jesus. And He died. That's why Romans says He died for us. He took our place. He took our place on the cross. And now, when God looks at you, when God looks at me, He doesn't see us. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He sees the perfectness of Jesus Christ. That's why we're accepted in Christ. They call that, that's called imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness. Something that belongs to another person, in this case, Christ, and is given are put onto the account of another person. That's us. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ. That's why we say when Christ died on the cross, that verse teaches us that God took all of our sins and He laid them on the Savior. He laid them on Jesus. And he, uh, all our iniquities on Him were laid. And He nailed them to the tree. And God punished Him. And that's why on the cross, Jesus had to cry out, My God! My God, why hast thou forsaken me? We're separated from God. Sin separates us from God. The wage of sin is death. Death is separation from God. Jesus was suffering the wages of sin for you and me when he died on the cross. And so he took our sins, 
when we trust Him as our Savior, then our filthy garments are taken off and His righteousness as a new garment is put on. There's no stronger protection against Satan's accusations in your life than to be able to embrace the truth that I have imputed righteousness. I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm not standing before God in my righteousness. I'm standing before God in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There's nothing I'm going to do or not do that's going to help me to be accepted by God. I'm accepted on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done for me. That gives me acceptance with God. And I'm accepted in the Beloved. And so that's why Romans 8, Romans 8 and verse 1, the Bible tells us this, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation once you're in Christ. Why? He's already condemned your sins in Jesus Christ. Hey, if you've already legally, if, if legally you have been declared innocent, legally you've been declared not guilty for a crime, can you be charged for that crime again? No, you cannot. Legally, it's an impossibility. And so it is with God. It's a legal term. That word justification is a legal term. And we get that righteousness imputed to us by Jesus Christ. Let's, give it, let's look at statement number three. God also then places His righteousness in me. Okay? We get it on us. We've imputed righteousness. It, it puts on our account but there's also His righteousness that gets put in me. That's called imparted righteousness. Imparted righteousness. This is what Philippians 2 and verse 13 is talking about. Let's look at that verse, shall we? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians 2 and verse 13. Are you okay? All right. Philippians 2 and verse 13. By the way, let's start with verse 12. We'll understand our context here a little better. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not not as much in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, let let me look here a minute. It doesn't say work for your salvation with fear and trembling. That isn't what it says. It's saying work out your salvation. Do you work out something that's never been put in? No, it has to be in for you to work out. Now, when it says work out your own salvation, what does that mean? Well, let's keep reading and see if he'll tell us what it means. He says, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is you working. No, it doesn't say that, does it? For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So I can work out the salvation that I've received, imputed to me, and now imparted to me, because who's working in me now? God's working in me to will and to do of His good pleasure. Now, God's doing that in the person of the Holy Spirit. But He gives me the will. That What made you want to come to church tonight was God. That's why you had that desire. I think I'll go. Only unless somebody held a gun to your head and said, you're going, I don't know. Uh, but you wanted to come. When you want to do godly things, when you want to obey God, that's God working in you. Both to will, want to, and to do, the ability to do it, that all goes to God. That's because He's imparted righteousness to you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God. First part of verse 18. And so it's God, God begins to work in you. Hey, how many will admit, once you got saved, your desires changed? You've experienced that? And, and all of a sudden, you, you, did, you wanted different things than what you wanted for. And things that used to be funny to you weren't funny to you anymore. Things maybe you used to watch, you don't want to watch those anymore. You know, things you listen to, you say, man, I don't, I don't think that's a good thing to listen to anymore. And uh, those things, that, that's God working in you. It is imparted righteousness working in you. Now, I'm going to say, I'm going to illustrate this here when we get to the end, but I want you to understand something. Man, you understand, when man was in the garden, when God created man, He created him a three-part being. What was man? He was 
spirit, soul, and body. Okay, three-part being. God said the day you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. All right? They didn't die physically. They were still there. They died spiritually. What died? Their spirit died. All right? So now man is born from then on, from Adam and Eve on, man is born, and he's born with a, with a soul and with a body. His spirit's dead. His spirit's dead. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. Now, and, and he said that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is what? Spirit. What needs to get born again? Your spirit does. What is it that He quickened who was dead in trespasses and sin? He quickens your spirit. He brings that spirit back to life. When you got saved, your spirit came back to life. And now, that's the part of you that communicates with God. It's your spirit. That's why the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Because he's only got a soul and a body. The spirit's dead. And so there's no communication. And so the spirit is saved. That's why the verse over in uh, 1 John, I think, chapter 3, when it says... Uh, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. It's referring to the, that, that part of man that is born of God, your spirit, your spirit's not going to sin. That's been born again. Now we'll talk about your soul and your body in just a, in a little bit and help you understand that. But uh, God imparts, listen, He saves my spirit, my spirit, and you, I'll talk, I'm trying to not get too far ahead of myself here, but the then you have my soul. My soul, your soul, is our mind, our will, and our emotions. God imparts His righteousness to us in our mind, our will, and our emotions. Okay? In our soul. And, and He's imparted that. My, my spirit's fully righteous. It's sanctified before God. My soul in, is in a process of being righteous. That's why sometimes you'll do good things. Sometimes you'll do spiritual things. And sometimes you'll do some things that you'll say, what did I do that for? What did I say that for? Man, that, that isn't what a Christian ought to say. That isn't what a Christian ought to do. And, and you, you, you don't understand because your soul is in that process. That's why sometimes you'll do sanctified righteous deed and sometimes you won't. But in your spirit, you are righteous and you are, you are, in, in, you are righteous and, and sanctified in your standing before God. Okay, In my soul, I need to allow God to bring about the righteous deeds in my life and allow Him to work through me and to control me. That's where the yielding to the Spirit comes in, to where I'm controlled by the Spirit and not by me. Even, listen, the fruit of the Spirit, one of the, one of the saddest things that, that the, one of the, one of the sad things, there's a list, but one of the sad things with new translations is when they give the, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, they list self-control as a fruit of the Spirit. Well, if self is in control, how are you filled with the Spirit? It's spirit control, not self-control. Uh, you're, you're, if your self is in control, you're in trouble. Because self doesn't control self very well. And most of us found that out. And so I want to allow God to to bring about the righteous deeds in my life. Now, number four, what makes me accepted before God is my imputed righteousness. Not the imparted righteousness, but the imputed righteousness. It's not my righteousness or my good deeds, but it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ imparted to me. That's the assurance you have to fight Satan when he comes with your accusations. Most of the time when Satan comes with accusations, it's about those unrighteous deeds or the unrighteous thoughts or the unrighteous things you've done or said. It's the imparted, where God has imparted his righteousness, but you haven't allowed him to do what he wants. You're still doing what you want, what you think you feel, and you have moments and boy, he'll remind you of those things. And you don't fight him with your imparted righteousness, you fight him with the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. I am accepted by God. I am accepted in the beloved. I have a right standing before God because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. For this cause, 1 John 3, 8, was the Son of, Man, Son of God manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. That Jesus came to give us His righteousness. So we don't, and listen, it, 
go to Ephesians 4. Uh, let's see, back to Ephesians. You're in Philippians maybe. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Notice with me, Ephesians 4 and verse 24. Here he's, he's talking about putting off the old man and putting on the new man. Notice it says in verse 24, you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And so we, we allow God to, to put the true righteousness on us as an imputed righteousness and holiness which has to do uh, with the imparted righteousness that He gives us. But what the breastplate of righteousness does is we, we remember I'm standing before God not based on what I've done but based on what Christ has done. I'm accepted because of what Christ has done. Period. End of story. Get out of here, Satan. Okay? And, and, and you rebuke him with that. But the breastplate of righteousness reminds us then that it gives us the opportunity to renounce self-righteousness. We put down any tendency that we have to pat ourselves on the back and say, what a good person I am. A pastor had a young woman in his church who he could tell had become very despondent. And he was observing her and she began to carry a somewhat even angry look on her face as several weeks went by. She was relieved when she finally said she wanted to talk to him. She came in for an appointment and as she talked, she shared her burdens and she told of several deep and very distressing disappointments that she had come to in her life. They were, they were very hard blows and they had they'd upset her emotionally. And she began to question the goodness of God to her. And finally in tears she blurted out, God has no right to treat me this way. I've always tried to put Him first and keep sin out of my life. It's just not fair. It's not fair. Don't be too hard on her. You may have been there before too. In other words, uh, the pastor looked at her and he said, in other words, you're, you're saying, God, you have no right to treat me this way. I'm so good and nice. And boy, when he said those words and she heard those words, she really, she, th he said she began to laugh out loud at how silly that sounded. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Hey, let me help you with something. That's, that's the same after salvation as it is before salvation. All of our righteousnesses are still filthy rags. Not any more accepted after salvation than they were before salvation. God is good. God is good whether my experiences testify to the fact or not. God is still good. We say, we said before, is God's word our final authority? Is it our final authority in all matters of faith and practice? Does, does everything take second place to God's word? What if my experience says one thing and God's word says another? Then my experience is wrong and God's word's right. We've said that, have we not? Well, what about when we experience things and we go through hard times and we go through what we think are bad times or we go through what we think are wrong things that God has done? And we say, well, God's, God's not been good to me. Can we, and do, we, do we live by our experience or do we live by what God's Word says? It's easy when you're trying to rebuke somebody else's experience. It's a lot tougher when it's your own that you're having to deal with. Goodness is the essence of God's character. When our experience don't support that, then we listen to God's Word and we praise Him for His goodness anyway. That's exactly what we do. That's why James tells us what? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. There's different testings that you go through. You, if, you get, if, if you draw back and you get a little angry when you go through deep water, when you go through times of testing, 
You go through times of turmoil in your life and you, you kind of get up angry at that. You can be sure there's, there's a root of self-righteousness in you. That there's part of you saying, I'm better than this. I don't deserve this. That's self-righteousness. Can I remind you, the Bible says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. Any good in me or done through me is because of God. Period. Remember, self-righteousness is not acceptable to God prior to salvation and it's certainly not acceptable after salvation. Jesus had his most scathing words in the New Testament for the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were self-righteous. They thought they were better than anybody else. Okay? And he had scathing words for them. All right, let me give you principle number five. Remember, to be tempted is not sin. To be tempted is not sin. Hebrews 4 and verse 15. Hebrews 4 and verse 15 says, For we have not a high priest, that's Jesus, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. A man was very immoral, had a very immoral and sensual life before salvation. After he got saved, he was so pleased and happy when anything immoral or sensual was just nauseating to him, repulsive to him. He was thrilled. He was thankful that old things had passed away and all things had become new. But as time passed and time went on, he began to have times when the old fleshly passions were stirred. It might be walking through a book store or, or at the checkout line at the grocery store and looking at magazines. He'd be tempted to go look at them. Those temptations were greatly distressing him. He thought it was a sure sign that he's going to go back to his old ways that he's going to return to his old sins. He thought that someone who's redeemed and saved would not have those temptations at all. And he felt as like if the thought was there, then it's no different than doing the act. But listen, temptation to sin is not the same as sin. Jesus was tempted in all points, yet Without what? Sin. So temptation cannot be a sin. And listen, the Bible says over in the book of James, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Just take the first few words. Every man is tempted. There's nobody in the room who's immune to temptation. Everybody goes through temptation. That's not a sin. The sin is when you yield to the temptation. When you give in to the temptation. And Christ never did. And again, as you live in Him and He lives, more importantly, through you, you, cannot, you, you can resist temptation as well. He gave, Because He had the victory, we can have the victory. But just wanted to make sure you understand temptation is not the same as sin. Now, let me give you number six because this is where we'll wrap up our study for this evening. Sanctification is a threefold process. It's a threefold process. At salvation, we said at salvation our spirit is saved, our spirit sanctified and declared to be righteous. That's called positional sanctification. All right? Or we call that, as we said earlier, imputed righteousness. 
Christ's righteousness imputed to us, that's our spirit. That's why the Bible calls us saints, even though we don't always act like it. That's the true. Saints aren't just, you know, somebody in the stained glass windows. Saints in the Bible are believers. Because their spirit has been saved and it's set apart for God. Now, we said the second part of man is their soul. Our soul is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. That is in the process of being sanctified. Remember, don't, don't let the devil accuse you of your soul not being saved, not being set apart for God, because that's in the process. That's, what's, that's what the process is of being set apart for God and being sanctified to God. That's still a work in progress. Okay? Nobody, because uh, there's still times every one of us do what we think, what we feel, and what we want instead of what God thinks, what God feels, and what God wants. Now, we're, we're asking God, and you ought to be uh, desiring that God would take more and more control over that to where we will always desire to do what the Spirit wants us to do and not what we want to do. That's why, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. A threefold process. Our spirit is already sanctified. Positionally, we are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. Okay? Positionally, we're, we are set apart. Our soul, our mind, our will, and emotion is in the process of being sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly or entirely or completely. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's not all our... We're, we're not going to try harder for that to happen because verse 24 says what? Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. It's not a matter of me trying harder. Remember what Philippians 2.13 said? It's God which works in me, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. I just need to get out of God's way. How do men go astray? All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to His own way. How do we get in God's way? When we want our own way. I can't tell you, if, if I had a dollar, probably in 34 years of pastoring, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said to me, well, I know what the Bible says, but I'd be retired and I'd be pastoring in the Cayman Islands somewhere. Because we want to do what we want to do. And that hinders the process of the imparted righteousness that God wants to accomplish. The the Holy Spirit working in us to obey God's Word. God working in me both to will and to do of His good pleasure. That, that process there of the, of the soul being sanctified, the soul, uh, God imparting that righteousness to us and working that in our life, that, that, uh, we refer to that as growing in grace. You're growing in grace. Growing in your walk with God. Ephesians 4. Would you look there with me please? Ephesians chapter 4. This is, I hope you'll, you'll dwell on this a little bit. What you're, what you're getting tonight is not pablum, okay? This is, uh, this is meaty stuff. And I hope you're able to bear it. Verse 11, Ephesians 4. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. By the way, he gave them to the church. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now notice, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're growing in grace, and the goal is to measure up to the stature of who? Jesus Christ. That's the goal. I don't, you don't have to measure up to anybody else. 
You know, in Christianity, it's not be like Mike. In Christianity, it's be like Jesus. We'll talk about it Sunday morning from John 21 when Peter got all concerned about what John's going to do. Remember what Jesus said? What is that to you? Follow thou me. Uh, follow Jesus. And, and the measure is always Jesus Christ. Never look at another Christian and say, well, I'm better than they are. Or I'll never be like them. See? No, no, no. That's why Paul told the church of Corinth, you comparing yourselves among yourselves, comparing yourself with yourselves, you're not wise. Because we're measuring ourselves against the stature of Christ. And that's the goal. So our, 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 our spirit is sanctified immediately. That's positional sanctification. The, 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 the work of sanctification is still going on in each one of our lives and our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. That's a, that's a daily process. And it ought to be a growing process. And then the, the, the C is our body. What about that body? What about that, that stuff that we call flesh? You know what? That isn't going to be sanctified until Christ comes back for us. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. What's it talking about? It's talking about our bodies. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put immortality, then shall be brought past the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You, you read that context leading up to those verses and it's talking about the body. You're not going to get rid of this old body, this old sack of flesh until Jesus comes and He's going to give you a new body. And there'll be no uh, battling with sin anymore. No battling with the flesh anymore. Uh, you'll get a new body. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 2, we, will, we shall be like Him for we'll see Him as He is. Okay? We'll have a body that will be like Him. And then the process will be complete. As First Thessalonians, Paul prayed for them. He said, you're going to be completely, you're going to be wholly sanctified in spirit, soul, and body. And we'll be completely like Christ. Now, we have to actively put on the breastplate. Just like we talked last week about actively put on, gird your loins with the truth of God. Nobody can do it for you. Nobody's going to put the armor on for you. You have to put it on yourself. You have to realize how important it is and put that armor on. And listen, I, I, sometimes people say, well, when, you know, when's the best time to read your Bible? Well, let me, let me say, first of all, there's never a bad time. Okay? Anytime's a good time. But certainly, I would want to make sure that I consciously put my armor on every morning. You're, you're going out to do battle. You're going out against the, the forces of the world. I'd want to make sure my armor's on. You don't really put your arm. The soldier, if, if you went into the barracks and everybody was putting on their, their, their gear and getting their backpack and getting their armor and getting their, uh, everything ready to lay in their bed, you'd say, what's wrong with you? you take all that off to go to bed. Uh, so it's, I'm not opposed to reading your Bible before you go to bed at night, especially if you're having trouble sleeping. You ought to read your Bible. I, I, I tell people that and they say, well, I read my Bible, but I fell asleep. That's what you wanted to do, wasn't it? And, and that's okay. Don't feel bad about that. You know, your mind just unwinds at night. That's what it does. And boy, if all you did was put the Scripture into it, uh, the Bible says He gives His beloved sleep. Some of you think that means in church, but it doesn't. And put it on the armor. It's not passive, it's active. And so you have to lay hold of it. You have to take it. God gives us the victory, but we've got to lay hold of the victory. God gives us the equipment, but we've got to put it on. It's there, but we have to, we have to uh, apply it to our lives, all right? And next week, we'll talk about our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, that, that seems to me like it was a lot tonight for you to take in. Uh, think on it. Pray on it. Go back over your notes. Ask God to really use it to help you in your life, okay? Let's stand together for prayer.
Father, I thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the attention of everyone tonight. Lord, it seemed like a lot that we were covering. But Lord, I pray that I pray that folks would at least understand that by faith in Jesus Christ, you imputed his righteousness to our account. And we stand before you accepted not because of anything we have done or we can do, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We are accepted in the Beloved. And yet, Lord, we desire, as Philippians says, to work out, allow you to work out that salvation. That you would work in us to will and to do of your good pleasure. And that we would allow your imparted righteousness to be active in our life. And we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we would learn to walk in the Spirit so we won't fulfill the lusts of our flesh. We'll live less and less doing what we want and more and more doing what you want. And Lord, I pray that you'd continue that process until we see you face to face. We love you. We thank you for the privilege and opportunity to study your word together tonight. Dismiss us with your care now, Lord, and may others see Christ in our life this week. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Let's sing Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. God bless you. You're dismissed.